Now that we have the basic tools of ring theory, we consider special classes of rings. First, we organize. So, what we have so far is in this picture. We have rings. We always assume associative multiplication and multiplicative identity. Okay, if we drop the identity, we get an RNG. Moving to the inside, we have commutative rings. Then we have integral domains. So these are commutative rings with no zero divisors. One more step in, we have fields. So in a field, all non-zero elements are units. From here on out, we're only going to consider work with integral domains. So the big picture here is going to look like this. All the way on the inside, we have fields. We move out, we get Euclidean domains, principal ideal domains, and unique factorization domains. For this part, we focus on the basic properties of fields. So to begin here, we'll consider special types of ideals. Now, recall, okay, we're working in an integral domain. I'll call a subset I in R an ideal. It's closed under addition and closed under super multiplication. So not only is our ideal closed when we multiply two elements together, it'll be closed when I multiply an element of the ideal times any element of the ring, okay, in either order. Now we've seen this notion of an ideal is the same as the notion of the kernel of a ring homomorphism. So ideals are to rings what normal subgroups are to groups. Now, to get started with fields, okay, first definition, if I have an ideal M in our ring, we'll call it a maximal ideal. If whenever I try to fit an ideal I between M and R, Okay, it can't happen. We have to have either that i is equal to m or i is equal to r. Now, for an example, okay, let's consider the integers. If I pick p a prime, I could form the ideal generated by p. So this is going to be all multiples of p. We have that this is a maximal ideal in the integers. So let's see that. If we try to fit an ideal between p and z, okay, well. We definitely have that P is in the ideal. Let's suppose I have another element N in the ideal that's not a multiple of P. So that's not in the ideal P. Now, since P is a prime, that means greatest common divisor of N and P is equal to one. By Bazou's identity, I can find integers I and J, such as I times N plus J times P is equal to one. Now, N and P are in I, so if we multiply by any integer, each of these, we get another element of i, and then when we add, we still have an element in i, so that means that one is an element of i. That means that i has to be equal to all of the integers. So that means if we have p a prime, the ideal generated by p is a maximal ideal. For the picture, we'll partially order the ideals in z using inclusion. We'll see next time that the ideals in Z are always given as multiples of some fixed integer n. Now, our largest ideal is Z itself, so the multiples of one. For the next layer, we have the multiples of the primes. These are the maximal ideals, so there's nothing between this layer and Z itself. Beyond that, we have the composites. So for instance, we have the multiples of four are always multiples of two, multiples of six are always multiples of two, are always multiples of three, and so on. Now, we want to connect maximal ideals to fields. First question, what ideals appear in a field? So there's a nice answer. So recall, a field is a commutative ring such that the non-zero elements are units. So if x is non-zero, there exists a multiplicative inverse for x. So x times x inverse equals one. Proposition, r is a field, if and only if, the only ideals in R are the zero ideal and R itself. So R is a field if and only if there are exactly two ideals in R. Now, to go from left to right, we'll assume R is a field, and we'll assume we have a non-zero ideal I. I want to show that I is equal to the ring itself. If this is non-zero, then there exists a non-zero X in I. We're in a field, so that X is a unit. Now, because X is in the ideal, that means if I multiply by any element in the ring, we get something back in the ideal. So multiply by x inverse. x inverse times x is equal to one. 
That's in the ideal. That means our ideal is equal to the ring itself, which is what we were trying to show. For the other direction, we'll assume the only ideals are the zero ideal and the ring itself. Then I want to show that R is a field. So I want to show that any non-zero x must be a unit. Now, if I form the ideal generated by x, okay, what can happen? It's either the zero ideal or the ring itself. It can't be the zero ideal. We're assuming that our ring has a one in it, multiplicative identity. So one times x is in the ideal. That's equal to x, and we're assuming x is non-zero. So this ideal has to be the ring itself. Now, the ring has a one in it, so some multiple of x is equal to one. So some x times y equals one. That means y is gonna be the inverse of x. So x is a unit, that means we're in a field. So that's gonna give the other direction. So we have our proposition. Now, with maximal ideals, we could use this proposition to get a construction for fields. Theorem is, R is a commutative ring. I have a proper ideal M and R, so M is not exactly equal to R. Then the quotient ring R mod M is a field if and only if M is a maximal ideal. Now, the main idea, what I need is the quotient mapping carrying a ring to the quotient ring R mod I, where I is an ideal. Okay, and then this map is just given by sending each R to its coset on this side. With this, we're gonna have a correspondence of ideals. So the ideals in the quotient ring are gonna correspond precisely to the ideals I prime that contain the ideal I and R. Now, the way I go from here to here, from left to right, we're just gonna take our ideal I prime and just push it to the other side. So we're just gonna take all cosets corresponding to elements in I prime. Not too hard to show that this is an ideal on this side. So I'll leave that to you. In the other direction, if I have an ideal in the quotient ring, so I'll call that I bar prime, we're just gonna take the inverse image of this map. So if you track out the definition, what this is, as a technical, we're gonna take all A in the ring, such that the coset A plus I is in the ideal I bar prime. And again, it's straightforward to show that this is gonna be an ideal in R. Now, once we have ideals, okay, on each side here, we have to show that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And again, I'll leave that to you. With the correspondence, the theorem is straightforward. So in one direction, Okay, we assume quotient's a field. By the proposition, there are only two ideals. Okay, the zero ideal and the quotient ring itself. With the correspondence, that means the only ideals that contain M are M itself and R. So that means there are no ideals between M and R, and M is maximal. For the other direction, okay, we assume M is maximal. Then if we take the quotient, okay, go to the quotient ring R mod M, only ideals are the zero ideal and the quotient itself. So again, by the proposition, we have that R mod M is a field. So that's our result. Now, with the theorem, we have three ways in which we can construct fields. So just using the theorem itself, okay, for instance, I could take R equal to the integers. We have P a prime, then the ideal generated by P is maximal. We take the quotient, we get Z mod P, and we've seen that that's a field before. Now, to contrast this, we'll take R equal to the integers again, and I'll use the ideal generated by six. Now, this is not maximal, okay? This ideal is contained in the ideal generated by two and the ideal generated by three. If I take the quotient, we get Z mod six. Z mod six has zero divisors, so it's not a field. Now, I could push this one step further we note in Z mod six, we have ideals. Okay, the only ideals we have are zero, Z mod six, the ideal generated by the class for two, so it's zero, two, four, and the ideal generated by the class for three, so zero and three. So these are maximal ideals. If we take the quotients, okay, we'll get a Z mod two and a Z mod three, and these are fields. Another way to use the theorem we can construct new fields from old fields by adjoining elements. Consider the following example. 
I have phi carrying R join X, so the polynomials in X over R, into the complex numbers. Here, phi is just evaluation at I. So we carry each polynomial f of x to f of i. We've seen before that evaluation is a ring homomorphism. Here, it's on to. To see this, we note each linear polynomial, a plus bx, is carried to a plus bi. a and b can be any real numbers, so we'll have all complex numbers. Now, we have an onto ring homomorphism, so we can invoke the first isomorphism theorem. For that, we need to identify the kernel of phi. So the claim is kernel of phi is equal to the ideal x squared plus one. So that's all multiples of x squared plus one by polynomials. Now, for the equality, one direction's clear. If we take a multiple of x squared plus one, evaluated i, we get zero. So we have that the ideal is contained in the kernel. For the other direction, okay, let's pick an f of x in the kernel could always write f of x as x squared plus 1 times q of x plus r of x, where r of x is linear. The idea here, if the degree of f of x is strictly less than 2, okay, then f of x is linear, I let q be equal to 0. Otherwise, I just use long division of polynomials. Now, with this, we evaluated i, so this goes to 0, this goes to 0, and we have r of i equal to 0. Now, R of x is linear, so something to the form a plus bx. If we evaluated i, then I have a plus bi equal to zero, and a and b are zero. So that would mean that r of x is zero. Going back to this line, that means x squared plus one divides f of x, and the kernel and the ideal are the same. Now, when we invoke the first isomorphism theorem, okay, we're gonna have that quotient of r join x by the ideal, it's so isomorphic to the complex numbers. Now the complex numbers are a field, so we expect that the ideal x squared plus one be maximal. So let's check that directly. Now we'll call our ideal M, and I'll assume that there's another ideal I between M and R join X. So that means there's some polynomial f of X and I that's not an M. Same idea as before, I'll write f of X as x squared plus one times q of x plus r of x, where r of x is linear. Now by assumption, f of x is an i, x squared plus one is an i because it's an m, and m is a subset of i. That means both of these items are an i, okay, this product here is an i. So if I take the difference, which is r of x, that must also be an i by properties of the ideal. We also want the r of x not be equal to zero because then otherwise x squared plus one would divide f of x, and that would mean that f of x is also an m. Now with that, that means r of x is in the form a plus bx, and I want b non-zero. Okay, now, if I had b equal to zero, r would be equal to a constant that's non-zero, and that would mean our ideal is r join x. And then we'd have maximal immediately. So, we assume this. We apply our trick again. So the idea is gonna be I wanna write one plus x squared as a plus bx times a q of x. And then if I go one degree lower than here, I have to add a constant. I have that one plus x squared is an i. We have a plus bx and i. So that means our constant is gonna be an i. And we want our constant to be non-zero. Okay, if it was zero, that would mean a plus bx divides one plus x squared. I have that b is non-zero which would mean I have a non-constant polynomial dividing one plus x squared, okay, I have degree one. That can't happen because one plus x squared is irreducible over the reals. So that means this constant is non-zero. Now I have a non-zero constant in our ideal, so that means the ideal is the entire ring, R join x. So that shows that this ideal is a maximal ideal as expected. So, Putting everything together, okay, what do we have? First isomorphism theorem says, okay, we have R join X mod out by our ideal. So isomorphic to the complex numbers. We note our ideal is maximal. So when we take the quotient, we're gonna have a field on the right-hand side. If we wanna know how this is working explicitly, all we're doing on the left-hand side is evaluating at I. 
that's gonna kill off the ideal, and then we're just gonna be left with this linear term out in front. And that's how our isomorphism works explicitly. Now, the previous example works because x squared plus one is irreducible. We can't factor it non-trivially. If we take a polynomial that factors, say x squared minus one, ideal generated by x squared minus one will not be maximal. Okay, this ideal is containing the ideal for x minus one and the ideal for x plus one. When we take the quotient ring, what comes out will not be a field. So how should I think of this? Well, in the previous board, okay, we mod out by the ideal generated by x squared plus one. So remember when we mod out, we set the ideal elements equal to zero. So there we're joining an element x, such that x squared is equal to minus one. Okay, and normally we'd think of that as being i, but minus i would also work. So there will be choices. Here, we're adjoining an element x such that if we take x squared minus one, we get zero. So this x has the property that x squared is equal to one. So for this ring, I could think of this as all elements of the form a plus bx, such that x squared is equal to one when we compute. Now, we'll have zero divisors here. So I take x plus one times x minus one, Okay, these are both in this form, so non-zero. We have x squared minus one, which is one minus one, which is zero. So, zero divisors. Now, what we have is business of trading in adjoining for irreducible polynomials has a lot of power. Okay, and we'll see that when we get to Galois theory. So, for now what we have, f is a field. Okay, we're gonna take polynomial f of x and f adjoin x. Okay, it'll be non-constant. We'll have that. The ideal generated by f is maximal, if and only if f is irreducible. That's the same as saying that if we take f adjoin x, we mod out by the ideal generated by f. This is a field, if and only if f of x is irreducible and f adjoin x. So this is gonna give us an abstract field. If I wanna to go to specific fields, we're gonna evaluate at the roots of our irreducible polynomial. And this is an idea that drives Galois theory. Now, to finish, okay, a little bit of terminology. Okay, so if we have m maximal ideal in our commutative ring R, then we just call R mod m, the quotient ring, the residue field. To note, our third construction for fields, that okay, we've already went over this before, if I have R an integral domain, I could pass to the field of fractions for R. So this is just gonna take all fractions, R over S. Okay, we have R in the ring, S is in the ring, but not zero. And then we went through the formalism of this before. Now, we'll have that our integral domain sits inside of its field of fractions, just as elements in the ring over one. So for examples, okay, we have the integers sitting inside the rationals. If we take the fraction field, something that's already a field, we just get the field back. We have the Gaussian integers sitting inside of Q adjoin I. And if I take polynomial ring in X over R, the field of fractions is just gonna be the rational functions in X over R. So polynomials over other polynomials.